Blast Sun and his captive, Parasite, are on a hunt for the Captain and Mary Marvel in this tie-in to the Absolute Power event. But is it worth the cover price? Let's find out. We're going to talk about it right here in our review of Absolute Power Task Force 7, number 1, from DC Comics. See you in 3. Let's not mince words. No, this tie-in isn't worth the cover price, nor does it contribute anything meaningful to the Absolute Power event. It just doesn't. Does that mean Absolute Power Task Force 7 or VII number 1 is the worst comic ever? No, it's not the worst comic ever created, but it's rare to find such an obvious example of mediocre output on every creative level. Truly, this comic feels like it was made by middle schoolers for middle schoolers. Yeah, it's that kind of issue. Leah Williams, who's the writer on this particular issue, begins her disappointing tale with Amanda Waller inspecting depowered, captured heroes and villains in her government-sanctioned prison. We learn through the conversation between Waller and Last Son, who is the Superman-styled Amazo robot that's part of this Absolute Power event, that the Captain and Mary Marvel barely escaped capture thanks to Wonder Woman's heroic sacrifice in the Wonder Woman issue. Uh, side note, excuse me, Mr. Reviewer, sir, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, the issue where that sacrifice occurs that allowed Mary Marvel and the Captain to get away thanks to the combat with Wonder Woman it happens in Wonder Woman number 11, which doesn't come out till next week. So yeah, if you're wondering how that all happened, the issue where it occurs hasn't come out yet. So now the issues are being released out of order for a big sort of a world redefining event for DC. So far, we're not off to a great start. Waller deduces Last Sun needs help tracking the Marvels down because even a small amount of magical power is enough for them to pose a threat to Amanda Waller. She decides Parasite is going to be selected as the type of power-sniffing bloodhound Last Sun needs to figure out where the Marvels went because Parasite has been starved for energy for several days or maybe even weeks. We're not quite sure. It's never really defined. He'll do anything to have his hunger suppressed. Now we have Parasite working with Last Sun to track down the Marvels. All right, we're only a few pages in and already something starts to feel a little bit off with William's script. The Amazo robots were designed and built to hunt down and depower all the heroes of the planet, so it's not really clear at all why Last Sun isn't capable of finding the Marvels. Plus, we know from Absolute Power number one that the Amazo robots can take away powers permanently to power themselves up to become even more powerful. It wouldn't make more sense to have Last Sun simply absorb Parasite's power fully and become his own bloodhound. We cut to the Rock of Eternity where we find Mr. Dinosaur finishing a month-long effort to properly organize everything in the Chamber of Souvenirs. Suddenly, here here's this big crash things falling down and breaking and he finds Mary Bromfield and Billy Batson are making a mess as they search for weapons to defend themselves against more Amazo robots. And here we start to see the problems. Whatever tension was established in the main absolute power issues is completely gone because Billy bungles a sword. I'm not sure what he thought he was going to do with it. And that creates this sort of rude Goldberg type domino effect of crashes that feels like something out of a Charlie Chaplin skit or something from Buster Keaton. It's all slapstick and noise and nonsense. Billy and Marvel lament Billy's clumsiness, but they do it through eye rolls and bad puns, which puts a kibosh on any hope for establishing some dramatic tension that's going to keep you on the edge of your seat. Mr. Dinosaur listens to the adoptive sibling's troubled tale, and he shows them where they can get the weapons that were designed to help if they ever get depowered. However, they have to fill out a mountain of paperwork first, which is that running gag that was established when Mr. Dinosaur first showed up in the Shazam title. Uh, before they can complete page one, Last Sun explodes through the door thanks to the help of Parasite who led him to where they are in the Rock of Eternity and he immediately blasts Mr. Dinosaur who tries to get in the way. We're only halfway through the issue and already it feels like you're getting the short cut version of the story. How is Parasite able to track Billy and Mary to the Rock of Eternity as it floats in the middle of space somewhere? Why is the alien Mr. Dinosaur who's a stickler for mountains of paperwork still a running gag with the Marvels. I mean, with, we thought we were done with that nonsense, but we're still going. And who on earth is requiring paperwork since Mr. Dinosaur is now a sort of a quote-unquote employee of the Rock of Eternity? Williams is just throwing in gags. They don't make any sense. They're just trying to kind of tie this issue to the main Shazam title, which isn't in a great place right now. So it's just bad on top of bad. Last Sun searches for Billy and Mary among the shelves and filing cabinets when he's suddenly attacked by Black Adam, who shows up out of nowhere. The two fight with a lot of gusto and a lot of energy, which is good, but Black Adam appears to get the upper hand, which is great, when Last Sun unfortunately shows signs of verbal glitches because of something. He's apparently malfunctioning to some lesser degree, something that may come back up later. Just before Black Adam can deliver the killing blow, Last Sun 
reaches up, grabs Black Adam by the leg, and drains him of all his power. Generally speaking, if you take a few steps back and don't look too hard, the fight between Black Adam and Last Son is pretty okay. If you look closely, unfortunately, the fight choreography is a disjointed hodgepodge of fast-paced movements and character positions, but they don't work together. If you just take one single panel, it's not bad, but it doesn't flow logically in the progression. In short, Caitlin Yarsky, who is the artist on this issue, prioritized these snapshot moments that make each panel look good in isolation without actually thinking through the choreography. In effect, you could almost say there's very little choreography or none that appears to be very continuous and flowing logically. Billy and Mary use the fight as a distraction to escape, but before they can bolt through the exit door, which is a portal back to their house, Mary stops them to help Black Adam before he's killed. After some awkward banter about what to do, Billy calls Last Son ugly. I don't know why that works, but it does, apparently. And he's immediately captured. Billy and Mary's capture scene is just silly. I mean, there's no other word for it. Billy seems okay with letting Black Adam die until Mary gives him a disapproving lecture, which is a bit out of character for Billy. I mean, you'd expect him to be the one that so shows the amount of empathy and compassion necessary to cause him to pause and stop. But Okay, fine. And again, Yarsky didn't think the choreography of the capture scene through because Mary kicks over a row of filing cabinets from several yards away to try and stop Last Son, but Mary is standing directly next to Billy in the previous issue. So all of a sudden, she sort of magically teleports several yards away. Again, it's the idea of Yarsky using individual panels to make them look good, but not thinking through the flow of how that action sequence is supposed to work. For no apparent reason whatsoever, we cut to Steve Trevor as he exits a helicopter after landing on Gamora, where Amanda Waller has set up her prison for the supers. Last Son greets Trevor and escorts him past numerous cells, some of which contain Billy and Mary, so we know that they've been captured and now imprisoned. And the issue concludes with Steve Trevor being led into a room for a meeting with his new boss, who is Sarge Steele. The way Caitlin Yarsky has drawn him, apparently he has both of his human hands. Talk about a jarring shift out of nowhere and a pointless conclusion. Steve Trevor is regularly assigned to work for, with, and near Sarge Steele. So this final scene, which is supposed to be like this big shocking moment, a big reveal or cliffhanger, it just isn't. And the fact that Yarsky missed giving Steele a metallic left hand just kind of underscores the fact that this was a poorly researched comic. Okay, let's try and find a positive. What do we like about Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 1? As much as we're trying, not much. <laughs> if you're a completionist and collect everything about Absolute Power, it's not the worst comic in the world. I mean, I know we're picking on it a lot, but it's, it's really not that horrible. I mean, if we're looking for an absolute positive, probably the best thing is the coloring by Alex Gomez. The story and the rest of the art, eh, maybe not so much. Okay, what didn't we like about Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 1? Leah Williams' plot is a clunky mess. The plot is disjointed, it's pointless. The character voices are off, and Yarsky's admittedly decent figure work, and the figure work is decent, is offset by really strangely poor choreography in every scene that has action. Oh, and if that wasn't bad enough, a second side note, there's a pretty big action scene that's depicted on the main cover. That action scene never takes place in this comic. So if you're a stickler about false advertising, this is another one of those issues. Just thinking about the overall assessment, if you need to have everything about absolute power in your collection, you can pick up this comic. That said, if you're financially responsible enough to only buy comics that weren't written and drawn at an amateur level, and that's what it really feels like here, please avoid this issue. Just save yourself the money. So final thoughts, what do we think about absolute power task force seven number one? All the urgency, dramatic tension, and seriousness of the main event is just tossed out the window in favor of a silly, disjointed, poorly constructed mess of a comic. Williams' script has all the weight of a deflated balloon. I mean, there's just nothing to it. And Yarsky's confused action choreography is shockingly unskilled. I mean, really disappointing work from Yarsky on this one. Therefore, we're going to give Absolute Power Task Force 7 number 1 a 3.5 out of 10. In every sense of the word, this comic is just a waste of time. If you're a completionist, get it. If not, don't bother. But let me know what you think. Are you loving Absolute Power so far? If you are, leave a thumbs up. Let me know. And if you're not, leave a comment down below and tell me why you're not loving it. I want to see See if your opinion matches up with mine. Also, if you want to read the written version of this review, there's a link in the description. So go ahead and, and give that a click and uh, read through to your heart's content. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining. And if you like more reviews just like this one, stay tuned through the outro.